So welcome to this video, which is about flow control in TCP. The purpose of this video is for you to um, get an understanding of methods for handling congestion with a special focus on TCP slow start and what is called random early detection. So when we're talking about flow control, there are two potential bottlenecks in the network uh, when we are making a transmission. One is it, there could be a bottleneck in the network or a part of the network, and there could be uh, a bottleneck in the receiver side. So let's start looking at the potential bottleneck on the receiving side. Uh, this is why we are using what is called sliding windows. So the idea is that the sender constantly maintains a picture of the receiver's window. So the receiver's window is how much data the receiver is able to absorb at a given point in time. And the idea is that we can only send data if the window is open. So as soon as it's filled, the sender is blocked and it cannot do anything more. Um, so let's look at the figure which we have seen before in a previous video about how to do transmissions. So in the case here, if we look at what the sender is doing, the sender is starting to make a 2K write to the receiver. This is after the connection is established and during the establishment of this connection, the sender has been informed what was the window size. So nevertheless, it is now sending two kilobytes of data to the receiver. When the receiver responds, it sends the acknowledgement, but in the acknowledgement, there is also an indication of the window size. And the window size is how much more data we can cope with. So here's saying that now the window size is two kilobytes. So with a window size of two kilobytes, um, the application makes the two kilobyte uh, right, he is sending again two kilobyte of data, and then the sender is blocked, as you also can see on the figure. And the sender is blocked because now he kind of sent all the data that would fit into the window. And when the receiver sends acknowledgement back, he has now indicated that, that the window size is zero, and as long as the window size is zero, the sender is still blocked. After some time, the receiving side has been able to handle the data and cope with the data and is now sending back um, another acknowledgement containing both the acknowledgement and an updated window size. And this updated window size says now I have space for two uh, kilobyte more and he allows the, um, the sender to send two kilobyte of data which the sender is then not using fully, he is only sending one kilobyte. So the idea about the window size is that the, sender, uh, the receiver constantly communicate to the sender what is the window size and if the window size becomes zero then the sender is blocked until he gets an update. Um, what is important here to say is that TCP is an old protocol and back when it was developed um, having a limit of these 65,535 bytes was just perfect. But the problem is that with fast connections today, you can easily saturate this. So actually this window size, even if every time you send an acknowledgement, you send the full window size, this is, still, this is still a limiting factor in the connection. And therefore we can negotiate what is called scaling. So at the time when the connection is set up, the scaling is negotiated to say that we scale it up by a factor of, for example, eight or 16, and then the window size is 8 or 16 times higher than what is indicated. Um, and just having a sneak peek to the TCP header, which you will see in a later video, is that you can see here uh, that the window size is these um, 16 bits and included in the header. And actually, now we have the header here, you can also see the sin and the act bits that we discussed previously. Um, so that was about, um, we can say, the, con the flow control in the case uh, of what is happening on the receiver side is a limiting factor. So in, in addition to that kind of flow control, we also have an ad adjustment to network conditions, and this is what is called TCP slow start. And the fundamental idea is in TCP slow start is that we have a congestion window and we have a threshold. And I will just leave the slide here for, to you for reference and then move on to the next slide where it's more visualized. So let's look at how TCP slow start works with a concrete example. Uh, so what we see here is that we have the transmission number 
on the x-axis and the congestion window on the y-axis. So the transmission number is kind of also the timeline here. So we see that in our first transmission, we are sending just uh, one segment. In transmission number two, we are sending four segments. In transmission number three, we are sending eight segments, etc. So it means that we have an initial congestion window size of uh, one, and then we are incre increasing it by doubling it all the time until we reach the threshold value. In this case, the threshold value is uh, 32. So we increase it until we reach the threshold, and from there we have a linear growth until we reach the, a timeout. And a timeout would typically be when we have lost the packet and when we detect that we have lost the packet. So when we have a timeout, what we do is that we uh, react as if this is a simple uh, a sign of congestion. So we go back, we, what we do is we redefine the threshold to be half of the value at the timeout. So in this case, we set the threshold value to be 20. And then we set again the initial congestion window size to be one. And we start, now we are in transmission number 14, working up again with sending one, two, four, eight segments until we, um, uh, until we reach the threshold. When we reach the threshold, we then start with the, with the linear growth again until we have another timeout. And when we have another timeout, again, we reset the threshold value and we start back from our initial congestion window size. Uh, in this case, the initial congestion window is one, but it could also be chosen to have another value. The smart thing about this approach is that we constantly adapt to the network conditions. So if we have plenty of bandwidth to work with, then we will have um, a high congestion window size and we will be, work we'll be working our way up to, to high values. When we have a timeout, we will we then, we'll then um, uh, go back to the, to the new threshold value. So if we see that the traffic becomes really, really, really bad, uh, then the threshold value will keep on decreasing. But if we see that the traffic is getting better and better, then uh, or the traffic condition is getting better and better, then actually we will we'll keep on increasing the threshold uh, values. So that's a, that's a quite nice uh, way of constantly adjusting um, the bandwidth we are using. Um, there is a challenge here because we don't really know what is the lifetime of a packet. So what we use is we use the round trip time um, uh, as a kind of yeah we need to we need to estimate the round trip time because the round trip time is telling us when we would expect to receive an acknowledgement. So the round trip time is the time it takes from we send the packet till the, it reaches the receiver and we get the acknowledgement back. Um, and this is what we kind of can uh, can try to estimate. And what we assume here is that this is that it doesn't change that fast over time. So it's pretty stable even between different connections. Um, and therefore we try to always guess and maintain what it, what it, what it is in the particular uh, case we're working on. And in a particular connection, I mean, between connections, this can really vary a lot. So assume that you have a super fast uh, fiber uh, network uh, over a relatively short distance, then you could have round trip times as low as 20 or 30 milliseconds. Whereas if you're working on a, a bad Wi-Fi connection in a train, then I personally experienced round trip times which were uh, more than one second. So from a few milliseconds to, to a few seconds, that's really how, how, how much it can, it can vary. But usually it doesn't vary that much for a single connection. And that's why we, are, we, can, we can observe the past round trip times in a connection and then on that we can, we can define a heuristic. And usually in that heuristic, we will take into account not only we can say the average round trip time for the last 10 transmissions, but also the variance of them, and then use the variance in round trip time to estimate when we consider a packet to be completely lost. Um, the good question is uh, that we need to define also in our protocols is where to start. So when we set up a connection, uh, what, um, what round, -trip, round trip time estimate do we start using? And there, there are different schemes, but some are using, for example, past values from connections to a similar host, etc. Uh, what is important to say is that there is a lot of tuning that can be done 
actually when we are talking about TCP uh, slow start. Uh, so one thing is that we don't always have to wait for a timeout, uh, especially if we have an, a, let's say, a more unstable uh, connection uh, with a lot of variance in, in the round trip time, then the tendency would be that the round trip time estimate would be quite, uh, quite high. Uh, and in that case, in, we can also detect that we are missing an acknowledgement. For example, if we can see that we receive, we are sending three packets, one, two, and three, and we are receiving acknowledgements only for packet number one and three, then we can guess that then packet number two is probably lost and then we can retransmit it. And as long as we don't overdo it, it it's no big deal that we retransmit a bit too much. Uh, that, that's a trade-off um, uh, that we are making because it then makes it all a little bit quicker. And sending a packet or a duplicate packet is no big deal as long as we can handle it on the receive a site so we can identify this was a duplicate packet and we'll just throw it away if we already received it. Also, there might be no need to, to, to start from scratch when we are using TCP slow start. So if we are using what is called fast recovery, we might instead of waiting, instead of going down and doing this uh, initial congestion window or size one, we might actually go down and just use the threshold value and start from there. And again, if we have a very, if we have a network that has become very congested, then the threshold value will also go down. So we will still be um, be able to adjust our connection accordingly. We just start out a bit quicker than when using the exponential start. Um, another topic to mention here is uh, random early detection. Um, so random early detection really works at the network layer. Um, uh, the idea is that when the queue starts to fill up. So we can see that a, that a queue becomes long, but not long, so it could be a queue in a router. Um, and we know that, that if the router queue really fills up, then we start dropping packets, and then we get the packet loss in CCP slow start. Um, but that might be undesirable, because we go from one state, which is that all packets are being sent and received, and then until that we start losing packets significantly. And instead of getting into that very bad stage, we might want to react earlier. And that's what we call it early detection. So the idea is that we basically drop packet randomly depending on the queue length. So when queues become uh, probably above a certain threshold, uh, then the, lar the larger the queue is, the higher the probability that we drop a packet is. Um, the reason for doing this kind of uh, random uh, packet dropping is that the, that triggers TCP slow start. And then it kind of forces the connections to slow down without creating additional system load. So if we start getting from, if we start getting just a little bit a sense that now there could be a congestion scenario, then it's really nice that we, um, that we can do something about it at an early stage. And by doing this random early detection, so even before the problem really becomes big, we kind of start forcing the connections to slow down. There is a challenge in this though, because it works quite well with TCP, but for UDP, where we don't have the acknowledgements, um, uh, so we don't know what is the packet loss in UDP unless it's implemented at the, trans at the application layer, then it's, a, then it's a little bit challenging, and we might run the risk that if there is a lot of UDP connections, then they just start taking up the, the space because TCP is behaving nicely. So that was a bit about random early detection uh, and that is finishing this video. Thank you very much for listening and let me know if you have any questions or comments.